During the latter half of the 19th century, European empires began expanding their never-ending grip in the heart of Africa. Though coastal colonies had been established by the British, French, Dutch, Portuguese, and Spanish, a sudden rush in the late 1870s was fueled by Belgian acquisition of Congo. Leopold II, the King of Belgium, established Congo as his personal property for his own gain, using slave labor to extract lucrative resources such as ivory and rubber. The empires of Europe realized that many regions could be exploited with their relatively weak and inadequate militaries. The British ruled Cape Colony in what is now South Africa since the Napoleonic Wars. The conflict with the Zosa people for many decades left the colony bolstered and ready for combat. The bordering Zulu Kingdom was no stranger to war either. Shaka Zulu, the famed warlord esteemed by not only his own people but also by Europeans, built his tribe into a strong kingdom through conquest and the usage of gunpowder weaponry. His successors admired him and hoped to build up a Zulu army to rival that of the colonists. Though a rocky peace existed between British Cape Colony and Zulu Kingdom, it could not last forever as an influential British politician pushed the colony towards war. Sir Henry Bartle Frere, High Commissioner for South Africa, hoped to establish a strong South Africa and required the destruction of the Zulu Kingdom in order to achieve his goal. Sir Henry began sending ultimatums to catch Wyo, the King of the Zulus. The final straw came in January of 1879 when Sir Henry demanded the Zulu army to be disbanded, a demand Ketchwile could not accept. Cape Colony immediately began gathering forces from all available colonies, despite not having the authorization from the British government to do so. Lieutenant General Lord Kemsford led the invasion of over 15,000 men, armed with the newest weaponry, whereas King Ketchwile had 35,000 warriors most of which were equipped with only spears and shields. After camping at the small trading post of Rourke's Drift and leaving a small garrison there, Lord Kemsford decided to split his forces up, initially into five groups, and began the advance on Zululand, with the ultimate objective being Lulundi, the capital and home of Quechua. The second and third column, under the direct command of Lord Kemsford, were lured towards the east, towards Islandwana, near the main Zulu force commanded by Quechua's General Koza. The ensuing battle would result in arguably the greatest military defeat in British history against a foe with inferior web technology and weaponry. Almost the entire force, nearly 2,000 strong, were slaughtered due to the overbearing numbers, despite incurring heavy losses on the Zulus. The morale for the British was crushed. Forces on the front began pulling back to recruit. As both the British and Zulu began to brace for what was next, Kichwao's brother, Dabi Lamanzi, took 4,000 men and advanced on Rourke's Drift, despite orders being given to stay. The two commanders left in charge, Lieutenant John Chard and Lieutenant Gonville Bromhead, began mounting a defense with what they had. 140 British regulars of the 24th and 104th Regiments of Foot, as well as a handful of civilians and locals. Before the battle, 100 NATO native horse under Lieutenant Alfred Henderson arrived after retreating from Islandwana. The Zulus numbered anywhere from 3 to 4,000 surrounding a small encampment. They also had a limited amount of snipers on nearby hill. The battle commenced around 4.20 p.m., opening with the NATO native horsemen engaging the main Zulu vanguard. Both the men and the horses were tired from previously fighting at Islandwana and abandoned the battle, seeing the situation as doomed. A few minutes later, the Zulus began the advance in the encampment, mostly attacking the southern and northern walls. The British Martini Henry breech loading rifles could penetrate the Zulu shields. The Zulus took heavy casualties, but eventually wore the British down. An hour and a half into the battle around 6 p.m., Char pulled most forces from the outer walls into the inner hospital. Grueling fighting began in and around the hospital, resulting in fierce hand to hand combat. The British would push out of the house, retaking some of the yard at multiple points. The wounded had to be evacuated to the inner parts of the building, as the outer rooms became unsafe. The British continued to hold out until dark and even after, as waves and waves continued until around 2 a.m., and sharpshooters pestered the garrison until 4 a.m. All in all, 17 British were killed and 15 were wounded, whereas the Zulu suffered 350 killed and 500 wounded, about 20% for both sides. 11 Victoria Crosses were awarded to the defenders at Rourke's Drift. Seven went to the 24th foot, making it the most awarded to a regiment in a single battle. The decisive victory at Rourke's Drift practically erased the crushing defeat at Islandwana, and with a surge in British confidence, 
The second invasion would take the capital of Yulundi in a matter of months. The Zulu Kingdom would be annexed by the British and remain part of their empire for nearly a century. If you enjoyed this documentary and want to learn more, I recommend watching 1964 film Zulu and 1979 film Zulu Dawn, detailing the battles of Warsh Drift and Island One, respectively. This documentary is part of our Scramble for Africa documentary. Make sure to subscribe for more videos like this one. Please consider supporting the channel on Patreon. I've been Bloxor for History of Forge. Thanks for watching.